This morning we're going to be looking at John chapter 13 in verses 18 through 30. And uh, here's where our Lord Jesus um, declares to his disciples that there is a traitor in the midst who is going to betray him. And uh, that is going to be used by the Lord, of course, to prove that he is, in fact, who he said he was. Now, in order to sort of jump into the context of this particular passage, because as we saw last time, there were a couple of themes woven through the paragraph we were looking at, we excluded this particular theme that we might take it up now. So uh, not wanting to cause any concern up, up on the, uh, the balcony, I'm going to read just verses 10 and 11 from the previous, uh, well, the previous verses, and then jump into verse 18, which is where they're going to begin displaying it. Uh, Jesus was saying to Peter when um, Peter didn't want his feet washed by the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and then when he found out if he didn't, he'd have no part of the Lord, now, well then Jesus wash all of me. Uh, Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean. By the way, you, there is plural, he's referring to his disciples. You are clean but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. Now jumping into verse 18. Again, I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. But it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. When Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. The disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. There was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. So Simon Peter gestured to him and said to him, tell us who it is of whom he is speaking. He, leaning back thus on Jesus' bosom, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus then answered, that is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. After the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Therefore, Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Now, no one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. For some were supposing, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things we have need of for the feast, or else that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now remember last time we saw Jesus at the Passover feast with his disciples. That's where he is right now, and he's going to be there uh, for the five chapters, uh, including chapter 13 through chapter 17. We saw how he began his teaching at that particular time, with an extraordinary example of humility and love by washing the disciples' feet. Now we saw that that foot washing was not something the Jews would typically do for one another at a feast or even when they had people over to their homes, but something that they would show to strangers. It was a particular thing they would do when they were showing hospitality to those who were traveling. Now the fact that Jesus did this, we, uh, well, we, we should assume was to remind his disciples that they were really just pilgrims and strangers. That's what we are, just passing through this world. This isn't our permanent home. Heaven is our permanent home, and we need to keep it always before our eyes. Now, I know when we're younger, that's a little bit more difficult to do because we think that time is sort of stretching endlessly before us. There's all these things in this world to enjoy, and the Lord is not telling us, don't enjoy anything. But what he is saying is don't get wrapped up in the things of the world. Don't especially love the things in the world that are sinful because those who love the world will perish with the world. 
Instead, he says, keep your eyes fixed on the things above because that is where you are headed if you are trusting the Lord, and that place is far more glorious. I do believe Jesus was pointing that out to his disciples. Now, on those occasions when foot washing was actually practiced, it was done by the servants, not by the master. The lesser would always wash the greater's feet and not the other way around. But when it was the other way around, as it was on this occasion, it was an act of the greatest humility. I mean, let's remember who Jesus is. He is God in human nature. He is the creator of the universe and the Lord of the universe who became a man for us and, our, and for our salvation. He's the one who took the place of the servant and humbled himself to wash the disciples' feet, to teach them and to teach us that we should humble ourselves and wash each other's feet. Remember, the way to be great in God's kingdom is not by seeking to promote ourselves over others, but it's by humbling ourselves to become the servant of all. That's what Jesus did, and that's why he was elevated to that place above uh, all power and authority. God has given him the name above all names. So the Lord tells us, if you want to be great, humble yourself, serve one another. He also says, follow my example and humble yourself and love and minister to the needs of one another. But Jesus also washed their feet to show them how much he actually loved them. Uh, it was a picture of what he was about to do. He was about to shed his blood, to lay down his life, that he might wash them, that he might cleanse them from their sins, that he might wash us from our sins. Let's not forget that sacrifice for the disciples is the same sacrifice by which we are saved if we are trusting in the Lord. And Jesus told his disciples, as he tells us, we need to lay down our lives for one another. Uh, Sometimes we have to set aside our comforts. Sometimes we have to set aside what we want to do in order to minister to our brothers and sisters. And we're going to be reminded, I think, in our text this evening that that is the mark of those who belong to Jesus, that they love one another. And that's how the world will recognize us and know that Jesus is real. Now, last time, we also saw that more than once, Jesus reminded his disciples that there was one who was present among them who would not be cleansed by that sacrifice. The only one who did not belong to Jesus, and that was Judas. Now, we read earlier, not, not this morning, but last week, in verse 2, during the supper, the devil already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. And we just read in uh, verses 10 and 11, where Jesus said to his disciples, you are clean, but not all of you, for he knew the one who was betraying him. John, John himself, who wrote the gospel, knew that uh, Judas Iscariot was the betrayer of Jesus. Of course, when he wrote this gospel, Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to include all these things. But it wasn't until the Passover meal, until this particular context, that he would first discover it. And that's what we see this morning. This morning, we see Jesus tell his disciples that he would be betrayed. And he told them that for the, really, the exclusive purpose, so that when it happened, it would again confirm to them that he is, in fact, God. Because only God can know the future, and tell what is going to happen in the future. Now this evening we're going to see how this was also a part of God's plan to glorify his son. So first of all, Jesus predicts that one among his disciples would betray him. And he picks up now from where he left off, as we saw in verses 10 and 11, where he had told his disciples, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet but is completely clean, and you are clean but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. Jesus told his disciples that basically all their sins had already been forgiven because they had put their trust in him. And this reminds us, because again, look where Jesus is. He's with them at the Last Supper. And he hasn't yet gone to the cross. And yet he's telling them they're already clean. Now, how can he do that? It's because the effects of the crucifixion 
we know were applied backward to everyone who had faith. Those who lived during the time of Jesus before he went to the cross, who saw him and believed that he was who he said he was and trusted in him, were cleansed of their sins before he went to the cross. Those who lived centuries before, even all the way back to Adam and Eve, if they were looking forward to the promised one, were cleansed by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, even though he had not yet been crucified because it was so certain to happen that God could already be granting forgiveness. By the way, we know that that sacrifice is also applied forward. But since the time of his crucifixion, his death still has the power to forgive if we are willing to turn from our sins and trust him and follow him. Jesus says he will wash us of all of our guilt and he will break the power that sin has over our lives. Now Jesus said they were all clean except for one. We saw that he left that theme in verses 10 and 11 for just a few moments to explain the example he had just given to them, but now he returns to it. And we read in verse 18, I do not speak of all of you, that is, you're not all clean. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Now Jesus, as we know, he's, he's God in human flesh, but we do need to remember that he is man. He had the limitations of man. It's a divine person in that human nature. And yet the Spirit of God had revealed to him those who belonged to him, those whom the Father had given to them, to him. Uh, these were the ones he had chosen to be his disciples. But he also knew that there was one there who did not belong to him. Jesus had told the twelve earlier in his ministry uh, on that occasion when many who were following him left him because they were offended by his teaching regarding eating his body and drinking his blood. You'll recall that in John chapter 6. We've already been through that. Jesus wasn't saying we had to do that literally, as some churches still believe today, that we literally need to eat his flesh and drink his blood. But what he is saying is we need to trust in the God-man to save us through the virtue of his broken body and his shed blood. That's how we would be saved. But many left because of that teaching. And then Jesus said to his disciples, he turned to them and he said, do you want to go away also? And then Peter speaks up and he says, Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. And then Jesus says this in John chapter 6, verse 70. Did I myself not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. Now, this isn't something that Jesus discovered at some point in his ministry. This was something he knew about from the beginning. He knew it when he chose them originally and called them to follow him. Now, he knew not only that Judas did not belong to him, but he knew that Judas was going to betray him because he says in the same context of John chapter 6 and verse 64, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and that was those that left him at that point, and who it was that would betray him. He knew Judas was the one. Now he knew that this was the case because it was prophesied that one of his close associates would betray him. Jesus quoted Psalm 41 verse 9, which we read earlier in our call to worship. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. And again, he knew specifically who it was through the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, Jesus is singling out one of his disciples and saying, this man was going to betray me. This man is a devil. This man I knew from the beginning was going to do this. Uh, we might pause just for a moment and ask a few questions regarding this because it does create some difficulty when we see that Judas was singled out for this purpose. We need to ask this question, knowing that it was certain because it was prophesied many years ago, because it was a part of God's plan, that someone was going to betray the Lord Jesus so that he might go to the cross. Was it certain to be this particular individual? Was it certain that it was going to be Judas? Well, I hope you understand the answer to that is yes, it's not no. It had to be one of the 12, 
as was prophesied, one who was a close friend, a close associate. Jesus was the one who purposely picked the 12 who would be his close disciples. Now we've just seen that he knew those who were his, 11 out of the 12. And we also know that he knew the one who would betray him. Jesus singled him out and he picked him to be a part of his disciples, knowing he would be the one who would betray him, knowing that one among the 12 was a devil. And since, of course, he knew those who were his, the 11, there's only the one left, and that is Judas. He was specifically singled out to do this particular deed. Now, the more important question is this. Does that mean that God made Judas do this against his will? Did Jesus force him to betray him? Did God force him to betray Jesus? Well, the answer to that is no. Judas betrayed Jesus because that's what he wanted to do. Judas was a thief. Judas, as John will tell us, if he hasn't already, it's later in this gospel, that he's the one who carried the money box. He's the one who liked to pilfer it, to take whatever was put in it for his own gain. He loved money, and he knew that if he handed Jesus over to the chief priests, that he could gain some money. That's why Judas betrayed Jesus. We need to take seriously what the Bible says. God never forces anyone to sin. He doesn't. We sin when we are tempted and are led away by that temptation and give in to it. It's our own fault when we sin. God simply uses the sin that is already in the hearts of his creatures to accomplish his good purposes. I mean, remember the example in Romans chapter 9 where... Uh, quoting back from the book of Exodus, how God says to Moses when he sends him to Pharaoh, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh and you're going to tell Pharaoh, let my people go, but I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart and he will not let my people go. Well, do we understand that as God injecting evil into Pharaoh's heart, making him sin so that he can destroy Pharaoh and destroy Egypt to glorify his name? No, that's not how we should understand that. We should understand that Pharaoh, in his own sin and wickedness, was exposed to something that would provoke that wickedness, which was Moses standing before him and telling him to let God's people go. Pharaoh would harden his own heart, but as an act of God bringing Moses to him. So ultimately, God was the one who did it. He pulled back his restraint from Pharaoh, from Pharaoh's heart, let Pharaoh's own evil harden his heart so that he wouldn't let God's people go, so that God would bring his judgments upon Egypt, which Egypt justly deserved. They were evil. They were wicked. God used that wickedness to glorify his name, and he did exactly the same thing here with Judas. We can't blame God for sin. We can't blame God for the evil actions, even though they are a part of his plan. God is using them for good. You know, Jesus even told Peter in advance, as we're going to see this evening, that Peter would deny him. It was prophesied. It was certain to take place. And yet, when Peter denied the Lord Jesus Christ, he didn't say, God, why did you make me do this? But he wept because he knew he had done it, because that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to preserve his life by denying Jesus Christ. He knew he had no one else to blame but himself, and so he wept over his own sin. This was Judas' fault, even though God chose him to be the one who would actually do this deed. Judas did it because that's what he wanted to do, because he loved money, and he wanted to betray Jesus in order to get a little more wealth. Now, here's another interesting question. Does that mean that Jesus was happy about Judas's choice? Well, some res in some respects, he had to be because it was a part of God's plan, but certainly not in every way. And I think here we see something that's, you know, that, that we ought to take note of in verse 21. When Jesus had said this with regard to one betraying him, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, Truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. Now, Jesus knew that he had to be betrayed by one of his own so that he might go to the cross, that he might die for the sins of all who would trust in him. And he rejoiced in that fact. 
and in the fact that, that his father's plan was moving forward, as we're going to see this evening, to glorify the Father, to glorify the Son, and to save his people. Jesus rejoiced in that. But again, he didn't necessarily rejoice in what this was going to mean for Judas. Jesus was troubled by this. And we need to ask the question, why? Well, who was Judas? He was one of his disciples, one of his creatures, one of his inner circle, a man who was made in the image of God, one that Jesus had, had basically been ministering to, one who had followed him, one whom he had loved. Even though Judas didn't love Jesus, Jesus still loved him and cared for him and ministered to him for three and a half years. He even commissioned Judas to go out and preach the gospel. And Judas did miracles in his name. He was grieved over the fact that one who had been so close to him was going to betray him. And he was grieved over the fact that he was, Judas was throwing Jesus away and he was throwing heaven away for 30 pieces of silver. What kind of a trade is that? Now sadly, there are many who reject Jesus Christ for far less than Judas. I mean, some do it for nothing. They get nothing out of it. Now we need to see here that whatever we might be tempted, whatever we might be tempted by to deny the Lord Jesus Christ or not follow him certainly is not worth it. Uh, Jesus is far more valuable than anything that we might possibly desire in this world more than anything that we might imagine. Now that's not how we always feel. That's not what we always see and think. The devil is trying to deceive us. Our flesh is trying to convince us that there are things in this world that are worth more than Jesus Christ, the fame, the wealth. But what did Jesus say on one occasion? What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? There is nothing more valuable, nothing more precious, nothing more worthy than Jesus. Now here's another question that we should ask. Is Jesus happy when people reject him and end up being condemned because it's, it's a part of the plan? No. Jesus is troubled by this. This is one thing we do need to take note of. Jesus, by his spirit in the Old Testament, said to the Jews in Ezekiel 18, verse 32, for I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. And let's not forget who Jesus is, I am. Therefore, repent and live. Do you want to know what Jesus wants? That's what he wants. Repent and live. Our Lord says in Ezekiel 33, verse 11, As I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. It's not that Jesus is saying that he only, you know, that he would only lament the fact that a righteous man dies. Actually, he doesn't lament that because when that happens, he's simply taking him home. But he doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn, that they repent and that they live. Our Lord does not rejoice in the destruction of any of his creatures. And he calls everyone to repent and live. But again, let's do justice to the other side of this. When they don't repent, when they, they choose not to embrace life, but rather to embrace death, it is equally true that when they are judged, when they are condemned, and when they are suffering justly for their sins, that he does take pleasure in the fact that justice is served. And I think we all understand that, at least at some level. If we see, for instance, a mass murderer who is not at all sorry for what he has done when he is executed, there is a certain justice about that. Whoever takes and sheds man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. That's what the Lord says. That is justice. And when justice is done, the Lord rejoices in justice. When those who have sinned, they refuse to repent, are justly punished for the crimes they have committed, that is pleasing to God. But when you consider the fact that one of his creatures made in his image is suffering in and of itself when he could have chosen life, there's nothing to rejoice about in that. In that, our Lord is troubled as he was with Judas. 
In a very real sense, our Lord desires the salvation of all men, which is why he commands the gospel to be offered to everyone. He doesn't withhold it from anyone, but offers it freely. That's why when we share the gospel with others, we can know that Jesus is sincere. And he's sincerely offering the gospel to them in his promise that he will give them eternal life if they will repent and believe and follow him. And we also know that when they choose not to, that he is troubled when they refuse that offer and die in their sins. And let me again just encourage those of you who are here this morning who may not have received that offer of eternal life. That troubles the Lord Jesus because he does not want you to perish in your sins. He will not be pleased by your death, but he will be pleased by this. If you turn from your sins and trust in him and follow him, he will receive you with open arms. That pleases him. Now we do want to notice here too that Jesus wasn't the only one who was troubled by his impending betrayal. The disciples were also troubled. In verse 22, John writes that they began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. Now we've already seen that Jesus told them earlier that one of them, have I not chosen you the twelve, but one of you is a devil. And maybe after all this time, Maybe after all they've been through together, all the ministry, all the preaching, all the teaching, all the miracles, maybe they had forgotten that one of them was going to do this, but now they've been reminded and looking at each other, they were wondering who it might be. Now Peter wanted to know so badly, he, he gestured, he signaled to the one who was closest to Jesus to ask him. We read in verses 23 through 25, there was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. So Simon Peter gestured to him and said to him, tell us who it is of whom he is speaking. He, leaning back thus on Jesus' bosom, said to him, Lord, who is it? Now it is generally accepted that that disciple whom Jesus loved that was reclining on his bosom is, is the author of this gospel, John the disciple since he is the one referred to as the one that Jesus loved because he was close to Jesus. Jesus loved all of his disciples, but he had his inner circle, and perhaps among them he even had one that was particularly close to him. But since he was close to Jesus, since he was so, as it were, taken into Jesus' confidence and the fact that he was close to him spatially or physically, Peter asked him to ask Jesus, and Jesus told him who it was. But apparently, John didn't get the chance to pass this information on to the other disciples. But this is what we read in verses 26 through 30. When he was asked, Jesus then answered, that is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took it and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. After the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Therefore, Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Now, no one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him, for some were supposing, because Jesus had the money box that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things we have needed for the feast, or else that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. Now notice, nobody understood what Judas was doing. Nobody understood why Jesus gave him the morsel, except for John, because Jesus just told John that's what he was going to do. Notice that Jesus kept it a secret. He didn't want the others to know. Apparently it wasn't a problem that John knew, and John didn't blow the whistle on him. Jesus kept it a secret, and he kept it a secret so that they would not try to stop Judas from what he had to do. So that Jesus would be betrayed. So that Jesus might glorify his Father, so that he might be glorified, and so that we might be saved. Now we're going to look at that a little bit more this evening. But here's a question that we need to ask. If Jesus didn't really want them to know who it was that was betraying him, why did he bring it to their attention at all? Well, it was so that when what he just told them came to pass, they would be firmly convinced who he really was. That's what Jesus says specifically in verse 19. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. 
Now, I've already emphasized this. Who is Jesus? What did they need to believe about Jesus? What do we need to believe about Jesus? Well, at the very least, we need to believe that he is the Messiah, the one God has sent into the world to be the savior of the world. But even more, they need to believe that he is the God of Israel. He is I am. He is Yahweh. You'll recall that's essentially what Yahweh means. I am who I am. Now, how important was it that they believe and that we believe that Jesus is, in fact, the God of Israel, that he is the God of the universe, the God of creation? Well, we already read about that in John 8, verse 24, where he said to the Jews, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. What difference does it make, whether you, what you believe about Jesus? Well, it makes the difference between eternal life and eternal death. Now, how important was this to the work that Jesus was about to call them to do? Well, they needed to understand who it was that they were to proclaim to others so that they might be saved. Jesus, the Son of God. Not Jesus the creature, Jesus the perfect man, Jesus the angel turned into a man, Jesus the, uh, the incarnate, uh, or I should say the, uh, one of these modern incarnations of Jesus, people who say, I'm Jesus reincarnated and so forth. It has to be the Jesus of the Bible. It has to be God in human flesh. Now they also needed to bear in mind, because this is who it is, that because God was the one who was calling them to go out with the gospel, armed with the gospel, to share the gospel with others, that he repeats again what he said earlier, those who receive them and their message would actually be receiving Jesus, who is God, while those who reject the gospel would actually be rejecting God, and I believe that's what he has in mind when he says in chapter 13, verse 20, truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. It's important to know who sent us. It's important to know who it is that people are receiving or rejecting when Jesus sends us. Now, when one of their own would betray Jesus, they would know who Jesus really was. And as I've said, the way that Jesus chose to reveal it, and he did it through miracles, of course, although there were other people who could do miracles only by the power of the Holy Spirit, only, of course, when God allows it. It could all, and what he chose, prophecy. That's another miracle that Jesus does. Now, there are other people who have prophesied, but they prophesy in the name of the Lord. Jesus was doing it in his own name, and he could do it because he was God. The fact that he was telling the future was showing them that he was God, because only God knows the future. Now, this he did so that they would know he is God. This he has done so that we would know that Jesus is God as well, and so that we would know that being God, when he speaks to us, he tells us the truth. And we know this because Jesus can foretell the future. Now, Judas betrayed Jesus, just as he said he would. Jesus was condemned. He was crucified. He was raised from the dead on the third day, as he predicted. Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD as an act of judgment against the Jews, as Jesus said they would do, because they rejected him. Jesus could tell them these things in advance and know they were going to take place, and they did take place because Jesus is God. The one who saved us is God in human flesh. Now, if Jesus is God, we can also know that what he has said in his word regarding whatever he says is true, but especially regarding salvation. Jesus says, if we believe that he is, I am. If we believe he is God, if we turn from our sins, if we trust in him as our savior and submit to him as our Lord because that is what is in our hearts to do because we want to do it, we can know that we are saved. We can know that Jesus will protect us and keep us throughout our lives. We can know that he will bring us to heaven. And we can know 
that he will be with us as he promised he would be with us in the work that he has given us to do uh, as his church, which is the Great Commission, and he will give us success. Remember Horatius Bonner in the, the kind of men God uses in revival said that they were men of faith. They actually believed that God would do what he said he would do. And that's what we need to do as well. We need to believe it, and we can believe it because the one who speaks in the Bible is God. This is his word. We can also know that when we share the gospel with others, that we are in fact representing God. And when somebody receives what we have to say, they are receiving Jesus who is God in human flesh and they are receiving the Father who sent him. In other words, we are representing God in this transaction of the gospel, in this great commission. On behalf of God, Paul has said on one occasion, we beg you, be reconciled to him, be reconciled to God. Well, he's given us that same privilege. He's placed that same high calling upon our lives. He has bestowed this honor upon us that we might be his representatives to others. So may the Lord help us to see again that particular uh, point here, that we're not just representing a man, not somebody who was deluded, uh, but somebody who is God in human flesh as we bring the gospel of reconciliation to others. And what we bring to them is backed by God himself and sealed with the blood of his son. Now that's something that we need to bear in mind as we prepare to come to the Lord's table. Is that the one who died for our sins, the one we are saved by, is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what makes salvation possible, not, not the Lord's table. But what the Lord's table represents, which is the death of Jesus Christ, the death of the God-man. He willingly went to the cross and laid down his life. He said to his disciples, that he might wash them all of their sins, and not just all of his disciples except for the one, but wash all the sins away from his disciples, past, present, and future, so that having saved them, they would be forever saved. How do we know that's true? How do we know that if we trust in Jesus, we will be saved? It's because Jesus is God, he does not lie, and what he promises, he is able to do. And that's what the table reminds us of this morning. So let's, um, let's spend just a few moments now in silent prayer. And let's um, ask that the Lord would reaffirm to us who Jesus is and what he has done. Let's renew our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, our trust in him. Let's be prepared to repent of every sin that we may not have acknowledged yet and we, that we need to confess to him. Remembering, too, that even where we forget some, he still cleanses us of our sins, but let's come believing, let's come repenting, and let's remember that um, we have to do this because of the warning in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We don't want to come in unbelief, we don't want to come uh, without having repented of our sins because to do so would be to incur discipline if we know the Lord, um, judgment if, if we don't. So let's, let's spend a few moments in prayer and let's prepare ourselves to come.